But what just happened then? Well, in the order in which it transpired, Lando Norris failed to get out of Q1 in the mega McLaren Mercedes. In Q2, Lewis Hamilton was fastest in the Mercedes and Fernando Alonso failed to get into Q3. And then in Q3, virtually from nowhere, the Ferraris locked out the front row of the grid, 1-2, Max Verstappen, P3. Let's talk about a weird qualifying session, trying to make sense of it now. Let's look at some of the factors involved. Very high altitude, 7,300 feet. One of the, in terms of the big cities of the world, one of the highest above sea level. Very thin air. The teams therefore run pretty high downforce settings given the layout of the circuit, given the layout of the straight, the long straights. But the high downforce doesn't have anything like the same effect that it would on a circuit somewhere near sea level. So that's one point. Secondly, Pirelli bringing the softest compounds in their tyre range. So that I think is a factor. Thirdly, take into account all the wrinkles and the characteristics of this current formula, this ground effect formula where everybody, apart from Red Bull, usually has a big problem getting it right, getting the aero efficiency they need without compromising the speed on the straight. So in a nutshell, in my opinion, the cars which don't inherently generate a massive amount of ground effect downforce, in other words, that don't have enormous aero efficiency, the Ferrari, the Alfa Tori, the Alfa Romeo, all did very well around Mexico because they could use the soft compound tyre very well. They got the most from the tyre. Whereas the cars which actually generate a lot of downforce, the Red Bull, the McLaren, the Mercedes to some extent, overused their tyres to the point where the drivers found it quite confusing from one set to another, from one aspect of the lap to another, whether it be the first sector, whether it be the second sector or the third sector, trying to marry the three sectors to put together the perfect lap. But it was very difficult. As Max Verstappen said after qualifying, he never really felt that the car was at its best in sector three, which is the tight stadium section, basically. And that's because, basically, he'd overused the tyres getting to sector three in sectors one and two. And it was impossible for him not to do that because there's so much downforce in the Red Bull and the car uses, uses its tyres normally so well that by the time it got to sector three, it had overcooked the, the soft tyre. And I think that's what was going on. I think what we're seeing here is a reward for the teams which don't have great inherent downforce, but it's been rewarded by Pirelli bringing the soft tyre to Mexico and the circuit being incredibly slippery. But if you're using the soft tyre well, there is grip to be found for one lap. Not really two. As Charles Leclerc said rather laconically at the end of FP3 uh, this morning in Mexico, when they said, oh, by the way, uh, Carlos's second lap on the, on the soft tyre wasn't any quicker. And, and Charles said, yeah, whatever. You're never going to get a quick lap out of the second lap on these tyres. So, and I think that says it all. I think for one lap, if you use the tyres well, the grip was there to be taken. I don't think Red Bull, surprisingly, ever found that lap because they have so much inherent downforce. They can't get it out of the car. Same with McLaren. They were pretty quick uh, with, with Oscar Piastri uh, going up to Q2. But by the time we got to Q3, everybody pushing absolutely on the limit, maximum engine power. It was overusing the tyres. And Oscar only qualified seventh. I mean, say only seventh, a lot better than Lando Norris. So what happened to Lando? I think Lando was a victim of this confusion of the McLaren having a lot of downforce these days. We've been talking about that, uh, sometimes at the expense of how quick they are on the straights. But here in Mexico, they seem to have got the balance pretty good yesterday and, and in FP3 uh, before qualifying. But in qualifying, Lando was pushing very hard under pressure towards the end of Q1 and lost the back end going into the effectively the second chicane. There's one chicane at the end of the first straight and then they go down a short straight and then another turns probably four and five. And he lost it there and that basically lost the lap. Then he slowed down uh, for the rest of the lap and then tried to get in another lap. And even if he had been able to go quicker, he wasn't able to anyway because there was a massive traffic jam and nobody in the back half of Q1 was able to improve their time. So because of that mistake, Lando was not able to, to make it through to Q2. He'll be devastated by that because at the same time, Oscar Piastri was qualifying P2 in the other McLaren. And that's just what Lando doesn't need. I wouldn't say that this mistake was necessarily down to the pressure that's been applied specifically this weekend by Oscar Piastri. I think it was more Lando's driving, the way he goes into the corners, likes to get in a little bit later, gets on the power quite early. And, and, and I think at this point, 
the tyres were overused because the McLaren had a lot of downforce and the back end just went away. We, Fernando Alonso had another massive spin today in the Aston Martin, another car which could never, ever get the right feel or grip level out of the tyres, out of the car. Fernando just couldn't drive this thing. Fernando couldn't drive it. Lance Stroll didn't get out of Q1. Fernando made it into Q2. So very, very strange thing. Combined the very smooth track surface, the high altitude, the soft compound Pirelli tyre, very sensitive, obviously, to, to the way it's overused, like all soft compound tyres. And then you look at cars like the Ferrari, which have never had great inherent downforce, but they've been pretty good in a straight line, pretty good under high speed braking, as I've been saying for quite a long time now. And if you put that car into the perfect storm of a new set of Pirelli soft tires, and you've got Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz both out there driving very, very well. Charles possibly slightly quicker through the change of direction high speed S's, uh, but, but Carlos matching him all the way. And you've got a car that's maximizing the Pirelli soft compound, whereas the Red Bull, Max Verstappen, basically found the limit of that car. And with the amount of downforce that that car generates through the medium and high-speed corners, and also, of course, through, uh, through slow speed, then he was overusing the tires. And that's why he wasn't able to get the grip in the, in the third sector, in my opinion. Same with Sergio Perez, just sort of scale it back a little bit from, from Max Verstappen of what was going on there. And so which of the teams, which don't have a lot of downforce, were going to benefit most from this? Well, Alfa Romeo have looked pretty good all weekend and did very well. Both cars threw into Q3. And Valtteri Bottas driving particularly well. But the driver and the car that has benefited most from this perfect storm is the Alfa Tori driven by none other than Daniel Ricciardo in his second comeback race from that wrist injury. Absolutely superb, just loving the feel of the car, able to feel the Pirelli soft tire grip and maximize the car around that. And it was just brilliant to see. I mean, look at this, Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz, 71-17-2, Max Verstappen, 17-2, which he did twice. He couldn't go any quicker than that. That was the physical limit, I think, of the Red Bull around Mexico. Daniel Ricciardo, 17-3, 17-5 in the second phase, but there was a lot of traffic. Not many went quicker then, but that 17-3, beginning of Q3, just stunning. So happy for Daniel. At the end of Q2, to see him just ahead of Oscar Piastri as well, talk about a little bit of, well, I won't say, I was going to say poetic justice, but imagine how Daniel felt at that moment in this comeback. He's in the Alpha Tori. He's been watching all the headlines about Oscar Piastri, all of which are justified because the guy's brilliant. And here's Daniel obviously putting on the headset and listening to his music while other people, including me, have been talking about how, what a shame it is that uh, Liam Lawson isn't keeping that drive into 2024. And here's Daniel just getting down, getting on with the job and using his innate feel to get the best from that Pirelli soft tire in a car which isn't swamping the soft tire with lots of additional downforce. I think that is the key point. And Daniel just happened to be in the right place at the right time and maximized the opportunity. So he will be starting the Mexican Grand Prix P4 in the Alfa Tori. Bit of a shame for Yuki Sonoda because he's starting from the pit lane because of various bits that had to be changed on the car going into the weekend. So he was never really in the running and he must be feeling absolutely livid that he's had to sort of go into the weekend just preparing for a pit lane start and uh, or back of the grid, whatever it's going to be, and, and not being in the game at all. But Daniel Ricciardo, Talk about a guy that deserves it, really, after all he's uh, had to sit through and live through over the last 18 months. All of his own doing, of course. He should never have left Red Bull in the first place, but that's another story. And beating Sergio Perez, i got to say, in the other Red Bull. Fans cheered him on throughout the day. Every time he was out, the whole place erupted. But Daniel Ricciardo outqualified Sergio Perez around Mexico. Again, there's a headline story for you. Lewis Hamilton, as I say, was quickest in Q2. He wasn't particularly quick in the first phase of Q2, did an 18-3, but then in the second phase on his second set of soft tyres, a 17-5. Now this was Lewis finding the absolute limit of the car, much as Max found the absolute limit in, in Q3. Th that's how it transpired. But we thought at this moment, wow, is Max going to do a 16-5 or something now if Lewis is doing that? Because that wasn't to be the case at all. So very impressive performance by Lewis to be purple, quickest in Q2 and then go into Q3 with that level of confidence. He would have been a little bit disappointed at the first part of Q3 because he did a 17.6, a tad slower than he'd gone in Q2. 
exactly the same time as George Russell. And it would have been a little bit of, oh, here we go. Here's the same old story. George perhaps jumping ahead right under the pump. But in the second phase, the last phase of Q3, Lewis went from 17.6 to 17.4. Really, really good performance. Very cool under pressure, driving superbly. And I think that was the limit. Two tenths quicker. And George, meanwhile, couldn't go any quicker. He did another 17.6. So Lewis out qualified him by two tenths. He'll feel very good about that. But he'll not feel good just as Sergio Perez won't feel good about being out-qualified by an Alfa Tori around Mexico. And nor on this occasion can Mercedes say, well, a lot of the reason for that is because we're still not massively quick on a straight because we have so much downforce. Because Lewis, 345 kilometers an hour on the straight on that quickest lap, 17.4. Daniel Ricciardo, 343. So absolutely the same terminal velocity as the Mercedes in the Alfa Tori, but Daniel quicker around the overall lap. In my opinion, just getting more out of that soft Pirelli because the Alfa, because the Alfa Tori does not have, as I say, the same level of inherent downforce as the Mercedes. Just to talk through the top speeds in qualifying, Charles Leclerc 350, Carlos Sainz 348, Max Verstappen 349, so very close. And quickest of all, Sergio Perez 351. So his fans have at least got to be pleased about that. And they can't blame top speed or engines uh, for Sergio being slower than Max around Mexico City today. The McLaren's Oscar Piastri, that is 346. Uh, about the same, just one kilometre an hour quicker than Lewis Hamilton and a little bit quicker than George Russell. Uh, we've got two Ferraris now. And so you would think, oh, well, you know, the two Ferraris, they can stop Max. Yeah, but how's that going to happen? Is it going to happen with Freddie Vasseur, as I speak now, taking the two drivers into his office in the motorhome area there and saying, or into the office area, and saying, right, very important that, First of all, you two guys don't run into one another at the first corner. Yeah, right. Um, good luck with that one. And secondly, make sure that you protect one another from Max Verstappen. Well, how's that going to happen? You know, it's uh, if, if Carlos is thinking of Max, he's not going to be thinking of Charles. And if Charles is thinking of Max, he's not going to be thinking of Carlos. And Carlos is going to have to go somewhere and he's going to be potentially down the inside. Max is potentially going to be slipstreaming them both and have the run, have the momentum. So, um, yeah, <laughs> Daniel Ricciardo there watching it all in his brilliant position of P4. What a place to be watching all that. So, yeah, that's going to, what that turn one is going to be the most dramatic of the year, I think, he says. You know, sometimes they're not, but it potentially could well be. Having said that, I mean, Max is so good at planning the race and making sure he stays out of trouble, touch wood, that um, on his behalf, I'm touching wood. Uh, I'm not biased at all. And, uh, and and so it'll be interesting to see how he plays that, you know, with those two Ferraris there. Top speed, very, very similar, very similar. And we may find that in DRS, of course, that the Red Bull has the slight advantage that it's more a more efficient car in a straight line with the DRS open. So we'll see what happens on that one tomorrow as well. So it's going to be a dramatic race. After all that, you know, championship already sewn up. We've got this dramatic race with all these amazing turnarounds. So, yeah, going to be good. Can't wait for tomorrow. Thanks very much to Jetcraft and to Pitbox.io. And thanks to you for watching. Take care. See you tomorrow.